we're taking as our text, uh, verses 23 to the end of the chapter, Acts 18, 23. I'll begin reading at verse 18. And as we begin verse 18, uh, recall that this is uh, the end of Paul's ministry at Corinth, and he's making his way back to uh, Jerusalem and then eventually to uh, Achaia, or rather Antioch of Syria. Let's give our careful attention now to the reading of God's holy word. And Paul, having remained many days longer in Corinth, took leave of the brethren, put out to sea for Syria, and with him were Priscilla and Aquila. In Sancreia he had his hair cut, for he was keeping a vow. And they came to Ephesus, and he left them there. Now he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And when they asked him to stay a longer t- for a longer time, he did not consent. But taking leave of them and saying, I will return to you again, if God wills, he set sail from Ephesus. And when he had landed in Caesarea, he, he went up and greeted the church and went down to Antioch. And having spent some time there, he departed and passed successively through Galatian, the Galatian region and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Now, a certain Jew named Apollos, an Alexandrian by birth, an eloquent man, came to Ephesus, and he was mighty in the Scriptures. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in spirit, he was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, being acquainted only with the baptism of John. And he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wanted to go across to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him, and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he had arrived, he helped greatly those who had believed through grace. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Be seated, please, and let's go to the Lord again in prayer to seek his face for his blessing on the preaching and the hearing of his word. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks for your revealed word. We thank you, O Father, for all that you have shown to your people concerning Jesus Christ and his church. We pray, O Lord, for the illumination of the Holy Spirit. We pray that we would be given insight and understanding into your word through his ministry. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We overlooked... uh, We, I say we, meaning I, overlooked the uh, psalm of preparation, so we'll turn to that, Psalm 119Q in the book of Psalms for singing. 
Amen. The text that we're taking up today marks the beginning of Paul's third missionary campaign. And as was the case in his prior missionary campaigns, the apostle sets out from the city of Antioch in Syria. Years before, the Holy Spirit had spoken to the prophets and teachers in the church at Antioch. While, Luke says, they were ministering in the Lord and fasting, saying, Set apart for me Barnabas and Paul for the work for which I have called them. And so being sent out on that first missionary campaign, they sailed first to the island of Cyprus, then to Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, where they planted churches in the Galatian cities of Pisidian, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. Upon the completion of his missionary endeavors, Paul characteristically returned to the church at Antioch to report the success that God had given him in his ministries. So Paul and Barnabas did so that when they returned from the first campaign in, in Galatia. They did so again upon their return from the second missionary campaign to Macedonia and Achaia. And that's where we meet Paul today in our text. Paul has returned to report to the sending church, the, the, the church of Antioch in Syria. He's returned to report to them all that the Lord has done. And we read in our text that after spending some time there, he did something else that Paul characteristically did in these missionary journeys. That is, he went to the churches that he had previously planted and strengthened them. And it was particularly in the Galatian region that he did so. A Pisidian Antioch, Elystra, Derby, Iconium, these cities where he returned because they were on the way to his uh, missionary goal. And so uh, that's what Paul does. He's, he's an apostle. He's sent out. He has a sending church. That church has commissioned him. He returns. He reports. He gets his marching orders, and out he goes again to new fields, to open up new fields on uh, behalf of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul had spent a little bit of time in Ephesus. Not as long as they would have liked him to spend in Ephesus. He went to the synagogue there. He did what he always did when he came to a new city. and He preached the gospel of Christ to the Jews first. But after he had heard their pleas, he decided to move on. He had a vow to keep, and so he moved on. And we find him here embarking once again, having gone to Jerusalem to fulfill his vow, having gone to the church at Antioch to, to give his report, to spend time there with the brethren. We find him again embarking on a missionary campaign, the third missionary campaign, the final uh, campaign of Paul's ministry as a, a missionary for the gospel of Jesus Christ. But before Luke takes up the story of Paul's return to, his, uh, to Ephesus and to, uh, to Paul's ministry in Ephesus, he inserts an account of the arrival of Apollos on the scene. In the account of Apollos, we're, we're being brought up to speed on what happened between the time that Paul departed Ephesus for Jerusalem and then Antioch and the time that Paul returned to Ephesus to minister there. The, the vast majority of this third, of what Luke reports on this third missionary campaign, 
uh, is, is centered on Ephesus, Paul's ministry in Ephesus. And Apollos was uh, an important figure as Paul arrived on the scene there. He, he was to be an important figure in the church at Corinth as a fellow worker, Paul's fellow worker in the gospel. And in the present passage, although we're not told that he had been instructed by Paul himself, we know that he's come into contact with Priscilla and Aquila. And so he, he knows something of Pauline theology, and we can infer that uh, Paul was on board in sync, or rather, Apollos was in sync with, with Paul and, and his uh, theology. So we find this preacher, an, uh, an introduction, an uncharacteristically long introduction to a, a gospel minister, a gospel figure in our text this morning. And although not every Christian uh, is a preacher, Apollos represents every Christian. Every Christian is gifted by the Holy Spirit. Every Christian is incomplete in gospel knowledge. And every Christian should desire to be used in gospel ministry. Every believer in Jesus Christ is gifted by the Spirit, incomplete in gospel knowledge, and should have as their ambition to be used by the Lord Jesus Christ in gospel ministry. We'll look at three things together this morning. In the first place, God equips us for gospel service. God corrects our gospel deficiencies. And God blesses our gospel ambition. God equips us for gospel service. God corrects our gospel deficiencies. And he blesses our gospel ambitions. In the first place, God is an equipper. The Holy Spirit of the triune God is an equipper, and he equips his people for gospel service. By the time we meet Apollos in our text, he's already a long way along in his gospel equipping. He's already equipped to be a powerful preacher in the church of Jesus Christ. And through Luke, the Holy Spirit gives us something of Apollos' background, his birth, his ethnicity, his education. Apollos was a Jew and therefore raised and was conversant in the Old Testament scriptures. That was a great benefit to him in his preaching. He was an Alexandrian by birth. He was a Jew who was born in Egypt. Now, Alexandria, after Rome, was the most prominent city in the Roman Empire. It boasted a centuries-old Jewish population. When persecution arose and the church was scattered, many of the Jews were scattered to Egypt and other places around the region of Palestine. It was a city known both for Jewish and pagan scholarship. The Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, had come out of Alexandria. Alexandria was also the home to Philo, a well-known Jewish philosopher. So Alexandria would become an early Christian learning center. And with that kind of introduction, we're not surprised when Luke tells us that Apollos was an eloquent and learned man. One assumes the other. Given the standards of Hellenistic education, every learned man was trained in eloquence and every eloquent man was a well-educated man. Luke goes on to describe Apollos as a man who was mighty, mighty. 
a man who was powerful in the scriptures. It recalls, uh, it recalls the way Luke had described Moses. It, was, it recalls the way Luke had, had described Jesus, who was mighty uh, in the scriptures, a, a prophet mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people, Luke 24, 19. And then Moses in Acts 7, 22. Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians and was a man of power in his words and in his deeds. Quite striking, isn't it, that, uh, that Moses would be described that way by Luke uh, when he was so reticent to speak on God's behalf, begged God to raise somebody else up to speak to Pharaoh. And all of this meant, Luke says, that Apollos had been instructed in the way of the Lord and was speaking accurately the things concerning Jesus and was doing so with spiritual zeal. In other words, to the degree that Apollos understood the scriptures and understood the Christ of the scriptures, he preached Christ correctly, he preached Christ truthfully, and he preached Christ passionately. He'd been gifted by the Holy Spirit, and he was employing the gifts the Spirit of God had given to him. And that's what God does in the life of every believer in Jesus Christ. He equips us. He gifts us. He gives us gifts to make us useful to him in his kingdom. Every Christian is called to glorify and serve God in the ministry of the gospel. And the gifts that the Spirit gives are those gifts that enable every Christian to serve him in the church. Your background, your upbringing, the places you have been, the people with whom you've associated, the instruction that you've received, all of these things together are the things that God uses to shape you and to mold you for service in the church of Jesus Christ. God had equipped Apollos, Apollos. God had uh, molded him and shaped him. But while his powerful preaching of Christ was accurate to the degree that he understood Christ and true and delivered with spiritual zeal, it was incomplete. That brings us then to the second point. Namely, that God corrects our gospel deficiencies. Luke mentions one such deficiency uh, on the part of Apollos, namely that he only was only acquainted with John's baptism. Remember that the burden of John the Baptist was repentance. And so John came preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. John exposed his hearers' sins. He called them to turn from their sins, and he washed those sins away symbolically in the Jordan River in baptism. But John also understood that his baptism, the baptism baptism of repentance, was provisional. And so he pointed to one that was mightier than he was one whom he said he was not worthy even to stoop down and untie his sandals. This one, he pointed his disciples to, those who were following John the Baptist. He looked upon Jesus, and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the whole world. 
And Apollos' deficiency, the missing piece from, from Apollos' message, was that he'd never been taught about a new covenant initiation rite established by the risen Lord. In Christian baptism, God places his triune name on his people and our union with Christ in his death, resurrection, and exaltation is signified. Apollos understood, he believed, and preached the gospel of Christ, but he knew nothing of this new sacrament that preached the same gospel by water. And so when he spoke out boldly in the synagogue, and Priscilla and Aquila heard, they recognized a gap in his previous training. And with the humility of true servants of Christ, they, they took him aside in private, not in public, but they, you notice what the text says, they, they took him aside, they didn't embarrass him in public, and in private they supplied what was lacking. So there's no intellectual aggression here, but gentle persuasion that characterizes true and mature teachers of Jesus, who himself was gentle as he taught others, who wouldn't break off a broken reed, who wouldn't snuff out a smoldering candle. No matter how well God equips a person for gospel service, every believer has deficiencies that need to be corrected. Many of you, like me, didn't grow up in a Christian home. You perhaps attended church with your family, you were in Sunday school, and or you worshipped in a church somewhere for some time, perhaps even continuing to worship into your adult years, but you didn't have a true knowledge of Christ. You didn't have the true knowledge of Christ that leads to salvation. You lacked a sufficient understanding, and that's the, the first gospel deficiency that God corrects in us. He enlightens our mind. This is, remember, the, the work of the Holy Spirit to enlighten the mind. He awakens us to our sin and our misery, the sinfulness of our sin, the misery of our sin. He gives us a true knowledge of Jesus Christ. And then he does his work of persuasion in us. And he gives us a knowledge of Christ without which we can't possibly be saved. And even if you grew up in a Christian home, even if you grew up believing in Jesus, you had to have this work of the Spirit done in you, didn't you? You had to be convicted of your sin. Your misery had to be made known to you. You had to be enlightened in the knowledge of Christ. The Holy Spirit had to persuade and enable you to embrace Christ, or you never would have. All of us were born with that deficiency. Some of you grew up in Reformed Christian homes. Some of you have the benefit of learning the scriptures, the, the reformational understanding, the Protestant Reformation, and it's uh, the, the, the clear stamp that it put on Protestantism. But not all of us did. And so in various ways, God corrected our deficiencies in gospel understanding the doctrine of salvation, the doctrines of grace, helping us to see that 
It's not man who does the choosing, for example, but it's God who does the choosing. It's God who must sovereignly work in in men and women and children, or there is no working. All of us, even so, no matter where we are in our, our journey toward the celestial city, to heaven itself, we've all got deficiencies. None of us have it all right. We'd like to think that we have it all right, but none of us do. There are holes in our our theology. There are gaps that need to be filled in. And if gentle persuasion should characterize mature teachers as they instruct and correct, what is it that should characterize us as those who need to receive instruction, whose gospel deficiencies need to be corrected? Humility. The willingness to be corrected where we're wrong, to stand corrected, not to be so entrenched in these things that we have latched onto and, and have believed, some to our detriment. God equips us for gospel service. God corrects our gospel deficiencies. And thirdly, God blesses our gospel ambition. At some point in Apollos' ministry in Ephesus, he desired to go across the Aegean Sea and minister in Achaia with the hope that God would use his gifts in Corinth as he had used his gifts in Ephesus, where Paul had already enjoyed something of a fruitful ministry himself there in Corinth during his second missionary journey. And then the word that Luke uses expresses, uh, can express both desire and determination to do something. Here it expresses Apollos' desire. He wanted to do this. He had this as his ambition. Uh, but the determination he left up to the church. He went to the church, and the church concurred with his desire, and they sent letters uh, or a letter of recommendation, commending Apollos to the church at Corinth. They encouraged the brethren to welcome him there. And that desire, along with these uh, the letter or letters of, recomm- uh, of commendation for Apollos bore fruit. We read that he was of great help to those who had believed through grace in Corinth. It's been suggested that the reason Apollos desired to go to Corinth in the first place is that he was a Jew, and he had heard that there were those in Corinth who who had opposed the gospel, and that he, he wanted to go there to preach to the Jews. But whether or not that was his driving ambition, that's what he did. Luke tells us, verse 28, that he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating or proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah prophesied of old. Now that's, this man was obviously following in the footsteps, was gifted by the same spirit as the Apostle Paul, and was doing precisely what the Apostle Paul did. These men were co-laborers in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You remember that description in uh, Paul at Thessalonica in Acts 17. and verse 2, according, according to his custom, he went to them. And for three Sabbaths, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. He went to the synagogue of the Jews, reasoning with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that The Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, This Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you, is the Christ. That was Paul's gospel ambition. That was Apollos' gospel ambition. And what's interesting is that the church at Corinth 
would later make their preference for either Apollos and his ministry or Paul and his ministry a matter of contention in the church. But Paul wouldn't have anything of that. He he writes in his uh, first letter to the Corinthians, Now I exhort you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and there be no divisions among you, but you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. For I have been informed concerning you, my brethren, by closed people, that there are quarrels among you. I mean this, that each one of you is saying, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Listen to what he says to them in response. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized into the name of Paul? No, his driving ambition, the thing that made his spiritual heart beat was to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul made sure that he emphasized to the church at Corinth as well that it wasn't Apollos, wasn't a, it wasn't Paul who were anything, but it was the sovereign God who did the work. One says, I am of Paul. Another, I am of Apollos. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 4. Are you not mere men? What then is Apollos? What then is Paul? Servants through whom you believed even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So as we think about the interaction between these two men, Paul's previous ministry in Corinth, Apollos' ministry in Corinth, we're reminded of what perhaps is the most important lesson that we could walk away from this text within our hand. Namely, that gospel ambition must always be tempered with humility and selflessness. What do I have that hasn't been given to me? Who am I that I should be given such gifts? Who am I that God should call me out of all the nations of the world, out of all the peoples on the face of the earth, and make me know the truth of Jesus Christ? Give me a correct understanding of the gospel. Who am I that God should call me to do anything? but clean out the bilges. That's what every Christian should say. We must adopt that attitude uh, that the the one who preached that baptism of repentance had, John the Baptist himself. When he said of Christ, he must increase, I must increase. Decrease. He must become visible. I must become invisible. He must be exalted. I must be put in my place of humility. Is there a more important application of this text for us this morning? Thank God that he corrects our gospel deficiencies. If he didn't, nobody sitting here today professing the name of Jesus Christ would be here. 
Not one of us would be sitting here today doing what we're doing today. We would be out and about or in our homes chasing the same idolatries we had chased all our life long until the Spirit of Christ broke through and enlightened our minds in the knowledge of Christ. Thank God that he corrects us. That's humbling in itself, isn't it? There would never be Christians to be equipped. There would never be ministers and elders to equip them. There would never be deacons to serve them if God hadn't corrected this basic, essential gospel deficiency in us. I think that's the first thing that we should do as we walk away from this encounter with Apollos is is get on our knees and thank God for the work he's done in us and is doing to correct our theological deficiencies. But then consider in what ways you need to be instructed in a way more perfect. What pieces are missing in your understanding of the faith? What holes are there in your theology or Christian practice of that need filling. Be humble. Be open to correction. Submit yourself to the truth of the scriptures. Furthermore, you should take, you should take stock of your equipping. How has God equipped you? How has God gifted you? The Bible tells us that the Spirit gives gifts. He's gifted every believer with gifts. What gifts has he given you? How does he want you to use them in the church of Jesus Christ? But then, consider your gospel ambition. Is it your ambition to serve Christ in the church? Is that what you long to do? Is Christ your all in all as he was for Paul? So that when Christ calls, when he instructs, when he commands you to serve him in his church, you, you listen to him. And you enter into that service willingly. If God has truly saved you, he's gifted you spiritually, and he commands that you use your gifts in the church. You should have this ambition if you're a Christian. If you don't have an ambition to serve Christ in his church, to the level of gifts that he's given you, to the degree of strength that he's given you, then you have to ask yourself whether you're a Christian, truly. Because a calling an effectual calling by the Holy Spirit necessarily translates into a calling of service in the church. Listen to the way Paul puts that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 11. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men we are made manifest to God. And I hope that we are made manifest also in your consciences. For the love of Christ controls us or compels us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for he that died and rose on their behalf. So what Paul is saying is that if we're truly united to Christ, if we're truly united to him in his death, in his resurrection, 
and in his exaltation. It's inconsistent to be compelled to do to give priority to other things over that which God has called us to do for Christ and for his church because the love of Christ compels us. If you don't have gospel ambition or if that gospel ambition is waning in you, as it sometimes does, doesn't it? If you're honest with yourself. Ask God to give you an increased desire to serve him in his church. Ask him to use you in the work of service in the church. If you lack health, if you lack strength, ask him to strengthen you to do so. That's a request that God will not refuse. He can't because it's a request that translates into his honor, his glory, and the honor of Christ, his son, and his glory as well. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you as humble servants. We acknowledge, O oh Lord, with great thankfulness, the work that you've done in us, giving us eyes to see and ears to hear, not leaving us blind and deaf to stumble around in this world. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts that you've been pleased to bring us out of darkness and into light. We pray, O Lord, that you would be pleased to... Remove our ignorance, correct our deficiencies, instruct us in a way more accurate, fill in the missing pieces, humble us, O Lord, cause us by your Spirit's work to be open to correction and to submit ourselves to the truth of the scriptures, no matter what that means, how that translates into our lives practically. And enable us to serve Christ. We also confess that we grow weary of serving, that we need the infusion of the Spirit's strength and help so that we might serve him more fervently in the church. We pray, O oh God, that you would not let us walk away from this sermon without being impacted by the great truths that you have set forth in this text. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.